Good evening from Johannesburg, South Africa. My name is Khadija Patel, um, and I am really looking forward um, to this discussion. Um, it's just on sunset over here. We're enjoying a balmy spring day. So I hope wherever you are, you are uh, enjoying similarly good weather. Um, we have a, uh, a great panel uh, assembled here, but we are also talking about something that's crucially important. Um, the International Press Institute, um, uh, who are, of whom I am the vice chairperson, documented at least 17 countries um, in recent months who've enacted some sort of legislation against quote unquote fake news or online misinformation. So South Africa is one of the states that passed um, regulations um, as part of the lockdown. Uh, we had one of the strictest lockdowns in the world uh, earlier this year. And um, as part of the set of regulations that were passed was basically um, I don't know, pretty much criminalizing um, disinformation. Um, and that was alarming for me at the time, I was the editor in chief of the Mail and Guardian. Um, I saw this and I immediately picked up the phone to our lawyer and said, we've got to challenge this in court. There's no way, um, you know, we, we can allow this to go on because who ultimately is the arbiter of what is fake or not. And my worry was that as soon as government does not like what we're publishing, um, that they would use this regulation um, to thwart us. Um, so my lawyer um, looked into it, came back and told me, look, the way the regulation um, is drafted, he believes it is near impossible for um, the government or the authorities um, to prosecute bona fide journalists or news publishers for, for quote unquote fake news. There was actually an arrest, um, you know, under this uh, under this regulation, it was a um, uh, a man in Cape Town who um, was actually using WhatsApp and other social media uh, to broadcast very unscientific, to put it gently, um, versions of what uh, you know of what was happening at the time. He was arrested, and so we didn't see um, this regulation being used en masse to thwart journalists. Um, and South Africa still has a very vibrant civil society. And though we did record some, inst some instances, instances in um, during which journalists were attacked, for example, um, journalists, uh, you know, went missing, um, especially, you know, community journalists had it quite tough. Um, Overall, we had it better than, for example, our colleagues in neighboring Zimbabwe or Tanzania. And the thing about COVID, just like it, um, just like it exposes existing frailties in our personal health, um, I think what it's done as well, that it exposes as well the frailties in our global systems, in our society. And we know that in recent years, um, levels of you know, press freedom around the world have actually been in decline. And along comes this pandemic um, ravaging populations. Um, and what it's done actually, it, I think, is that it's exposed um, uh, an undemocratic trend um, in much of the world and uh, a trend that sees the media as the enemy um, and sees governments uh, not shy or, you know, or afraid to actually use their might to, um, to throttle, um, you know, what's coming out of the press. So um, I've got a fantastic panel assembled uh, here to take this uh, discussion further. Um, Courtney Raj is from the Committee to Protect Journalists. Mira Salva is uh, joining us from the UK. She is with the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. And Peter Adeli, I uh, apologize if I've butchered any of your names, is a journalist um, from Hungary, uh, from the fantastic 444, the publication 444, um, which is quite inspirational, I think, for most of us, um, you know, most of us journalists. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm to kick us off. I'm going to invite Courtney actually 
um, to take us through what you've seen. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. The, so the Committee to Protect Journalists has been monitoring really since the outset of the virus what its impact on journalists, both in terms of from a press freedom perspective as well as a safety perspective, and what that impact was going to be. Because it was quite clear early on um, that it would potentially change the way that journalists had to do their work. And we feared, uh, unfortunately, we were proven right, that it would also provide an impetus for a crackdown on press freedom. Unfortunately, we see with many crises that they are also times um, of opportunities for authoritarian crackdown. In this case, we have seen that it really has rippled across um, different types of political systems. And so as we've heard the pandemic referred to as an infodemic, we see that the journalists are paying the price in terms of a range of factors. And so I'm going to share um, a map that we have produced that outline a few of these um, a few of these trends. So hopefully, can you see this map? Yes? Okay, I'm seeing nods. Excellent. So we are tracking essentially 10 symptoms of the press freedom. Uh, situation around the world and the backlash against the press. You'll see that we are tracking these 10 categories in different places around the world, but chief among these are the opportunity that the coronavirus has provided for governments for an excuse to wield fake news laws, um, the you know misinformation laws, sometimes under the guise of new health laws, sometimes existing laws, as a way to restrict independent reporting, to restrict critical reporting, especially on coronavirus response or on levels of infection, et cetera, and as a reason to implement new laws. So we would already seen that the number of journalists imprisoned on false news charges has risen over the past few years. We anticipate this will continue. Um, and we have certainly seen that now, you know, there seems to be greater acquiescence in many cases to authorities adopting the rhetoric around needing to, you know, prevent the spread of false news, but too often that is being used against journalists. We've also seen cases where journalists have even been expelled from a country, foreign, foreign journalists, for example, in Egypt, and uh, a, a reporter who reported critically and in contradiction of the official um, situation there was expelled. And we saw that Reuters had its license revoked briefly in Iraq after it reported on numbers that didn't comport with the official version. We have seen emergency laws proliferate. I mean, chief among these from Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orban essentially has the right to rule by decree now. Um, in Thailand, where the government can correct reports that it considers to be incorrect and allows for charges under the Computer Crimes Act. So really around the world, we're seeing the proliferation of laws, the arrests of journalists for contravening existing or new laws, and states of emergency that are being used to restrict these rights. Um, we're also seeing the issue of censorship. So both in terms of individual websites, but also when we see um, entire internet shutdowns around the world. And this obviously not only restricts the ability of journalists to report and disseminate their information, but as obviously has broad repercussions for um, other people you know, in that society. We have seen as well arrests, threats, and harassment. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. So we've seen these um, that journalists have also been um, threatened and harassed, not only by authorities, but also by the public. Um, obviously, we know arresting journalists is a tried and true tactic of authoritarian regimes around the world. But we've also seen that there has been some anti-foreigner sentiment in various countries or anti-minority sentiment. For example, in the United States, Asian American journalists or Asian journalists reporting that they were getting um, threats and, and harassment in India, hearing that Muslim journalists were facing the same. And also that the public doesn't un always understand how journalists are, you know, out there reporting, but also doing so in a way that keeps themselves safe and have even been attacked in public because of a perceived risk that maybe those journalists are bringing COVID back um, to their homes or to their populations. 
We've also seen that in some cases there are authorities who do not seem to be familiar with whether or not journalists are restricted by quarantine requirements or by stay at home orders. Um, there was a case, for example, in South Africa, which um, Khadija mentioned earlier, the situation there. Um, and, and, and elsewhere in the world where authorities have arrested or detained um, or assaulted journalists who are out trying to report during COVID. Then we've got the issue of, you know, all these journalists, uh, you know, with the exception of those who are out on the front lines reporting or who are photojournalists and their nature of their job requires them to be out. Many journalists are working from home. They're working from their computers and relying on digital technologies to do their reporting. As a result, they are particularly susceptible to hacking, surveillance, and other sort of, um, of course, online harassment and as other sort of threats that come with working in a primarily digital environment. And the issue of online harassment has been something that has really become endemic to the practice of journalism even before coronavirus. But in the wake, or I can't really say in the wake of coronavirus, it's still happening, but as we're seeing um, that more and more journalists, of course, and, and people in general, are um, living more of their lives online than they already did, that online harassment is a real issue that journalists need to contend with, that we need to think about how we can have more proactive responses to not only depend on journalists and what they can do to keep themselves secure and safe, but also what the tech platforms and what policymakers can do to do the same. Because one of the issues that, of course, is part of this infodemic is the disinformation and propaganda campaigns that that are being perpetrated by you know, many actors, including political parties and governments. And it's very difficult for journalists to counteract these coordinated online harassment campaigns or disinformation campaigns. And it makes journalism very difficult for journalism to kind of show out of the mix to, to rise to the top of the social media feed to, you know, to get through the algorithmic um, kind of, you know, decision making that favors uh, exaggeration and extremism, etc. Right. So there are a range of these types of threats. And I just want to wrap up by, you know, pointing out that we've also seen the expansion of surveillance regimes around the world that are ostensibly designed to help combat the spread of coronavirus or to help people understand if they might be affected. And while there are absolutely, you know, obviously very real health related objectives to that, and there may be some, you know, ways that technology can be used to help combat the spread of the virus. The problem is that in many cases, these regimes are being um, rolled out and, and implemented without sufficient safeguards on how that data can be collected, who has access to it, how long will it be maintained, and how can it be deployed. And we don't have yet any instances um, that I'm aware of journalists being targeted, but if we look at what happened in the wake of 9-11 and the so-called war on terror and how that gave rise to a surveillance apparatus that was then deployed against journalists, I I think that we all need to be aware. So in a world when that's what we're seeing around the world um, with respect to the different types of threats and challenges that journalists are facing. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, there's a lot to chew on and we'll um, maybe unpack um, a little bit of what you said um, during the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to turn now to Mira. Um, please take us away. Hi, thanks very much, Courtney. I thought it was a really excellent overview of what's happening, very, very comprehensive. Um, I agree with everything you say, so I won't repeat it. I think the two things I just wanted to highlight is that we're in this kind of very strange environment of what is a journalist and who decides what a journalist is. And this has been an ongoing debate played out, you know, across societies, but right now you have governments literally having to say, we, we give these sectors key worker status, we allow access to these individuals onto these parts of the street. And in many places, you know, we provide the licensing that allows journalists to go. This can be direct, this can be literally a kind of license to get into a press conference, but it can be a kind of wider thing of, are, are you given the right to travel to the next town? Um, and this is something that we see, it's, um, you saw this in the Philippines and I had journalists, you know, friends working as journalists in the Philippines who say it's a really strange 
idea that the president's office gets to lo get down to right down to local journalism level and decide which local reporters for a news publication are allowed to travel around. And this is hugely problematic for all the reasons you can imagine that you're giving authorities the um, the ability to kind of control this um, workflow, but also crucially, it's very unpleasant for the journalist involved because these licenses don't aren't linked to a newsroom or a story, they're linked to an individual. So that individual is the one who has to go out and if they get sick or are unable to go or don't feel comfortable going, nothing, you know, then, then there's a silence that, that that ability to travel can't be uh, moved elsewhere. So I think this is this is really dangerous. And we're only beginning to see the, the kind of implications and the, and the fallout from this, I think, in many countries, because my real fear is that this will somehow become the norm that we'll go, you know, we, I think a lot of governments for a long time have said, we would like a system of licensed journalists, please. And it's been too difficult and too unwieldy and there's not been public support for it. But I worry that it's something that's create, that we create in a crisis might become the norm. And the other thing, a kind of tandem to that is, as Courtney said, newsroom journalists are working from home, not just foreign correspondents, but domestic correspondent staffers. And so they are under tremendous amounts of pressure. They're often under attack, um, online attacks and political attacks. And they are not um, being able to access support networks at all. They're not being able to, uh, you know, access the support of their colleagues. They're not allowed being allowed to kind of vent in the kind of the informal network settings. But they're also sometimes not really being given places to say this is happening to me. You're sitting in your room, right, trying to report, facing all these pressures, and there is no outlet. And again, I think this is something that we're only beginning to see the impact of this because I can't see how this won't really traumatize people um, going forward. At the Reuters Institute, we've done a lot of research on journalism and news usage. So we didn't really focus on press freedom as such. We looked at how people are consuming the news during the pandemic. And, but there are some interesting um, trends that I think again will impact on press freedom, which is that at the beginning of the crisis, there was an absolute spike in news usage. There was a rallying behind the media, you know, the value of independent journalism was very clearly understood, both independent journalism and crucially public sector broadcasting, good quality public sector broadcasting were, um, you know, or they all saw spikes in usage with lots of people needing the information. That's fallen away, partly because it's become a very ongoing story. It's meant that other sort of stories haven't had any airtime. So people just get uninterested in the news because if you don't want to read the news on COVID, there's nothing else um, for you to entertain. And as governments mismanage um, the, 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 the responses to the pandemic, trust in media often falls along with trust in government. So you end up with a situation where the public is, is then kind of losing that original connection to journalism and journalists. And we have quite alarming research that shows that in many in the UK, you know, many people, about a third, um, think that the coronavirus situation in the UK has been made worse by how the media, news media coverage, how the news media has covered it. So, you know, so it's not just that it, they're ambivalent or neutral, but they, but they think that the news media is, um, is making, a, it's a, making a difficult situation worse. Now, if you tally that with the tendency of authoritarian leaders to attack the press and uh, say that the press tends to make societal problems worse, you can see that this is again, going into a very, very dangerous space for journalism. Thanks very much, Mira. Um, a lot to unpack there as well. Um, but we're going to go first to um, Peter. But before I um, invite Peter to begin, I just want to remind the audience that um, you can use the Q&A box to uh, ask the panelists anything based on their presentations or any questions you may have for any of us really um, about issues related to media freedom um, and COVID-19 or perhaps share your own experiences with us. We'd be delighted um, to hear from you. Um, Peter, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so before I jump into detailing the effects of the pandemic had on free speech in Hungary, let me give you a very brief relevant background of our general situation. So the current government led by Prime Minister Viktor Orban has been in power for over 10 years. Most of this time they had a super majority in parliament, changed the constitution eight times and reshaped or attempted to reshape every part of Hungarian society, mostly to increase their influence. This is especially true for media, where the government has been super effective. Over the past 10 years, government-aligned oligarchs strategically bought up newspapers, portals, TV and radio stations, and turned them into organs of government propaganda. By now, there is an unprecedented concentration of outlets under government control, 
and almost and after almost a decade of complaining about an unfair media sphere, Prime Minister Orban said last September that he felt now that right and the left controls 50-50% of the media, which he thought was you know, a, a good way to look at it. The pace of new acquisitions by the government by government controlled entities slowed down partially because there are very few independent outlets left to acquire. There was a kind of uneasy calm for about a year in 2019. Now, last October, the government lost some key cities during local elections. One of the contributing factors was a videotape that surfaced three weeks before the vote, which showed a prominent pro-government politician and a lawyer involved in some shady real estate deals taking part in an orgy on a yacht in the Adriatic. Drug use was also implied. I think this was a very important reminder for the government that their control of the media is far from absolute and a scandal like this could hurt them politically. It spread like wildfire despite the pro-government outlets trying to ignore it. When the pandemic and the lockdown began, audience number, and this is uh, something Mira mentioned, for, in the, for the remaining independent outlets skyrocketed. When people needed reliable information to make decisions about health, life, and security, they knew where to turn to. I think this was another important lesson for the government. They built a huge media empire, but it was not really effective in a time of crisis. While the COVID situation right now is really bad in Hungary, we had it relatively easy during the first wave. And because of this and the rally around the flag effect, the government was really popular. The pandemic was and still is the first thing on people's mind. It's, it's not free media that concern most people. Now we had Index. Uh, they were the largest independent online outlet in Hungary. They had problematic ownership for a decade, but they learned to produce great independent journalism, even, of, uh, even under government-friendly owners. So you have this realization that you need more control because of the scandals last year and after seeing media consumption patterns as the virus spread. People worry about other things than free speech, and you have a boost in popularity. The next general elections are scheduled for 2022, two years away. If you, if you want to do something major, this is the opportunity. And you have the largest independent portal, a thorn in your side for a long time, where you can influence the owner. So I think this was a perfect storm. And so the editor of Index was sacked in July. Most of this, uh, the staff walked in protest, and government aligned actors took over soon after. This was no master part. There was no master plan. There rarely ever is. It's a constant cost benefit analysis, in my opinion. What can be gained by taking over yet another outlet? What's the potential political cost? It was a combination of the above factors and the opportunities created by the pandemic that led to this, but the results are devastating nevertheless. Independent index is gone. They also operated the largest open blogging platform used by the most prominent civil society organizations from the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union to various LGBTQ groups. And now they don't have a conduit to reach mainstream audiences. We are trying to build something quickly, but it's, it's not a trivial exercise. In addition to all of this, the government wants to extend its influence beyond traditional media. And this is where our fake news law comes in which I, I'm not sure that it's aimed at journalists or aimed mainly at journalists. So as the virus began to spread, the government pretty much centralized all related communication. Only the Surgeon General and a few police officers were officially allowed to talk to the press on COVID related issues. If you call a hospital and ask about the number of patients they have or a research institution about the tests they use, you are told that they can't answer your question and you have to turn to the central government communication office. While there is a daily broadcast by the Surgeon General and the, the select group of police officers. And in theory, you can send them questions via email. They just ignore any questions they don't want to answer. So there's, there's no way really to ask anything. Now, during these daily broadcasts from the very beginning, the police began talking about the threat of fake news and fear mongering. Almost every day, they talk about how people can only trust them, official communications by the government and no one else. In the spring, the parliament adopted a really vague law that threatens anyone with a five-year prison sentence who spreads information that hinders the defensive efforts of the government. Viewers of the government's daily broadcast are constantly reminded of this. Be super careful about what you share on Facebook. It can really be dangerous. It can get you into trouble. So I don't think this is aimed at professional journalists. We have good lawyers and in-depth understanding of the relevant laws and our environment in general. 
But I think most people are not expect, ex experts on what constitutes free speech and why would they be? I think this is potentially intimidating and it can discourage ordinary people from speaking up. In the middle of May, police raided the homes of two individuals under this legislation and detained them. Both of them posted stuff on Facebook critical of the government and its handling of the crisis. An opposition mayor of a small town in south of Hungary was also investigated after posting about a possible infection in his town. The charges were later dropped in all these cases, but I think the damage may already be done. A healthy public discourse goes beyond professional politicians and journalists. We need the voices of teachers, doctors, business owners, your local bus driver. And when people see their neighbor being taken away by the police for something they shared on Facebook, it could be intimidating, regardless of whether they end up in prison or not. The police raiding their home in Don is, I think, warning enough. I think this is also an attempt at controlling stories spreading in social media, something that could potentially could hurt the government as they learned you know, during the Yacht orgy scandal most recently. The Hungarian Civil Liberties Union operates a legal aid hotline and reported a sharp increase in the number of people asking them about what they are allowed and not allowed to say on social media under this new legislation. People are asking them if they are allowed to post about their own experiences in hospitals, for example. Like my first example with index, in my mind, this is also a gradual process. It's not like the prime, prime minister suddenly got up one day and said, let's arrest people over their Facebook post. The government wants to control as much information as they can. They are trying to discourage people from sharing anything other than the official line. This is partially done by exagger exaggerating the threat of fake news. The police is under pressure to bring in cases. And because of the past decade of dismantling checks and balances at institutional independence, they can't resist. Since we don't have a huge COVID related fake news problem, but the police still wants to satisfy the demand of politicians, they start to bring in weaker and weaker cases and end up reading the, raiding the homes of completely innocent people. I think it's important to understand this an indirect mechanism. It's not a madman shouting mad orders. It's a gradual, slow erosion of every institution that ultimately leads to this in Hungary. The gradual nature of this process makes it difficult to properly and identify. And by the time you cross a clear lead grind, like arresting people for critical Facebook posts, it's very difficult to turn back. I began my career 20 years ago. And in my opinion, this is the most difficult time for Hungarian media and free speech in general since the democratic transition of 1989. In a crisis like this, it's almost inevitable for governments to gain more power. And in Hungary, this extra power, these parts of it is used to further restrict the space for independent media and free speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And I think that you've illustrated the point that these laws, um, you know, cannot be seen, um, you know, in isolation because they have such a chilling effect on democracy in general and, um, you know, people's ability to just express themselves. Um, that it is, you know, it it is something that we have to consider more thoughtfully. Um, I'm going to start with you because there is a question for you in the Q&A box about um, your map and uh, Tule Ate um, is asking why you don't have any data recorded for Turkey. Um, I'll have you respond to that. Um, sure. So, I mean, what I showed was a static map. We actually have on our website a, a more interactive map that uh, plots a lot of the incidents that we have reported on. I mean, I'm also looking, you know, on our website and just in the past month, we've reported on, you know, the trials that journalists are under, the asset seizures, all the cases against journalists, the the, you know, the compromised institutions, we actually just did a, a press freedom mission that was largely virtual um, with some people on the ground as well there to Turkey, because it really is one of the most challenging places to be a journalist, consistently leads as the world, you know, one of the world's leading jailer of journalists. Um, and just passed a very restrictive social media law, or I should say, 
a very restrictive social media law that was passed earlier just went into effect um, that we are you know really concerned about what its impact is going to be on journalists and you know informal citizen journalists as well we've seen you know the threats of asset seizures from Chandundar you know one of Turkey's leading journalists and award-winning journalists, um, the convictions under national security laws. So, I mean, I could go on and on about Turkey. There's definitely no shortage of cases. Um, I would say in terms of the snapshot, it is during a period of time. So go on the website, explore that. But we do have country pages that documents every country. And I can tell you, Turkey is one of the ones that I struggle to keep updated on because there's so much coming out of there. I'm going to um, take you up on, you said you, um, CPJ, uh, recently um, undertook a press freedom mission to um, Turkey. Uh, someone who, uh, you know, who also goes on press freedom missions um, and hasn't gone on a press freedom mission this year, largely because of COVID. Um, tell us a little bit about how the pandemic has also affected advocacy um, for media freedom. Yeah, you know, it's been it's been challenging. I, I have to say, like, on the one hand, Zoom or whatever platform based events are great because you can include potential participants that wouldn't ordinarily get together. More people can, you know, hear and, 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 and listen to them and ask questions, which I think has real benefits. On the other hand, when we can't meet in person with government officials or, you know, have the, the, those, those in-person missions to meet with journalists, to hear from them directly about what's happening, to send a signal, you know, to uh, repressive governments that there is a vigilant international community watching and supporting their local journalists and attempting to hold them to account, I think, you know, I think we're seeing it's, it's become very challenging. You know, we're just as journalists are limited in our ability to go out. Um, you know, we are not having the same types of, of meetings that we had, but I, I, I will say that we have continued, you know, in, in countries like the United States and Europe um, that do regularly consult with civil society as they have done, they have moved some of that into a virtual setting. So we actually have continued to do some briefings, for example, with the State Department on specific countries of concern with, uh, with the, the European Union and members of parliament there. Uh, it, it's a little bit harder, I think, to do advocacy because it, how can you stand out from everything else that people are dealing with? But I will say that one of the biggest focus for us this year has been on getting journalists who are jailed out of prison because it could amount to a death sentence, right? You can't socially isolate. You can, many of them don't have access to masks, the proper sanitation requirements. So really at this point, imprisoning journalists for their work amounts to the political prisoners and they need to be released immediately. We garnered a coalition of, I think it was more than 180 organizations around the world. And many of them were already working in their own countries. I mean, we just need to show the world and, and every country that has journalists in jail that they need to let these journalists out, especially if you're on pretrial detention. There was just a journalist in Egypt who died of COVID-19 in pretrial detention. I mean, it's, it's just, it's criminal. So you know, we, we wrote to the UN Secretary General, we asked him to make this a top priority. He emailed us back a letter you know, but we weren't able, you know, there was no UN General Assembly this year, we couldn't hold a protest, you know, we, it, it, so it's definitely changed things. But if anything, we're busier than ever, because um, we're not spending the time traveling here and there. So, you know, there are pros and cons. I mean, my, my commute from the bathroom to, uh, to my desk. Arduous. Um, just uh, for another follow up from there. Um, Converting these meetings that are often difficult at the best of times, uh, you know, for example, if you take the Turkish government, um, I would imagine that is, you know, some of those meetings are downright hostile. Um, considering, you know, the pandemic, um, have you felt a softening at all um, from authorities or are you seeing them, you know, more indifferent to journalists? 
So um, one, one I would say that uh, many countries, despite repression, are very good at speaking the terminology of the international norms and international human rights law. So it's kind of like, you know, 1984 double speak or news speak. So, uh, you know, it's, it's actually relatively, I wouldn't say we have a lot of openly hostile meetings. I mean, we definitely stick it to them, but uh, many authorities are well-versed in how to speak this language of international rights, even though it may not translate into anything meaningful on the ground. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, sorry, can you, the, the rest of your question was? So yes, uh, I'm, uh, I wondered whether the pandemic has led to any softening in the attitudes. Oh. Um, no, I think if anything, it has provided cover for crackdowns that either were already in place or that authorities were waiting for an excuse to do. So there have been a few cases, for example, of critical journalists who were already in the crosshairs, who then the government did finally target because they could use the, the excuse of COVID. I mean, it is really... It was, it was really hard with terrorism, you know, when you're trying to defend a journalist and they're being accused of terrorism, it's equally as hard on, in a health pandemic, potentially even harder because individuals, the public feels it in their own life. And so, you know, there seems to be a lot more leeway given to governments to, you know, control information, to restrict access, to set the rules of the game, who gets to go out, who gets accreditation, you know, all of those, you know, everything um, related to that. So I think it's become harder and people are, you know, they, they want to prevent the virus. They want to get back to normal life. And so, you know, a lot of people aren't able to, or, or don't want to push back on these surveillance regimes that are being rolled out. They're not, they don't want to wait until the human rights impact assessments are done or until the safeguards are put in place. And so uh, I think it's provided a serious and significant cover for authoritarian and democratic uh, governments and regimes alike. Thanks very much. I've got a question for, for Peter from Paula. Um, and she asks, do you think that the current mass protests sparked by the Hungarian government's move to impose tighter control over the University of Theatre and Film Arts could mark a turning point in public opposition to the government's attempts to curb freedom of expression? I'm, I'm not too optimistic, unfortunately. So this has been going on for uh, over a month now. Uh, it lasted a lot longer than I personally expected it to be and uh, I really admired the efforts of the of the students at the and the teachers at the university but I don't think that this is an issue that goes beyond you know Budapest and really speaks to, like I don't think this is again one of the issues people I'm sure it's concerning for some people that this is happening but there with you know rising unemployment and other very serious sort of life and death issues for a lot of people, I think this, you know, is just not on their priority. I don't see that, the like, this can go on, and obviously it's very unpredictable what's going to happen, but right now there's no incentive for the government to crack down on this. They can just let this go. It's not really threatening their, you know, rule over anything. And then the students are, you know, protesting or in the university buildings, they have hold their own classes. I don't I don't see this as gathering more momentum than it, it already has. But you know, I'm not an expert on on this. So this is just a very subjective assessment. Thanks very much. Mira, um, you know, we if we've just heard from Peter, um, I think you're very startlingly many of us, I think, have followed, uh, you know, events in Hungary over, in, in recent years from a distance and, you know, and, and noted um, egregious um, violations of human rights. But, you know, the way he's, you know, he's actually illustrated the, the, the control of, inf of information in the public sphere is really scary. Um, and, you know, so on the one hand, we've got this tendency that, you know, this documented tendency around the world um, for, uh, you know, governments to act in, a, in, a, in an authoritarian manner and, um, and impose restrictions on the way uh, the press does its work. 
And on the other hand, the pandemic has also been an existential threat to independent media as well, commercially. Um, and we're only likely to see the effects you know, of this in the coming months and perhaps over the next year. Um, I know here in South Africa, uh, you know, nearly every newsroom um, had to take salary cuts, there were uh, um, mass layoffs, um, and, this, and no one's out of the woods yet. Um, and the truth is that, you know, the, the economy may take a long time to actually bounce back. Um, so we have this possibility then of all our news either being controlled by a handful of billionaires on one hand who can afford to you know, buy up big titles as an ego project, and on the other hand, authoritarian regimes who you know, just want to cement power. Um, so what do we do? Well, I wish I knew, but you're absolutely right. Um, this is the big thing. This, uh, the media industry has been in crisis for a good decade. Um, the advertising model is broken. We haven't yet figured out what model is going to replace it. Um, independent journalism is getting harder and harder to pay, you know, to pay for itself. So it's, it's, a, it's something that's happened that was, has been happening for the last few years. And, and my institute, that's core of what we do at the Institute, we try and find ways and look at ways that the industry could, could continue to survive and move forward. And the pandemic has accelerated a lot of change that was happening anyway. So organizations that were struggling financially have just collapsed. You're absolutely right that hundreds, thousands of journalists have been laid off worldwide. The advertising revenue model, which was falling anyway, has again, plummeted because we're not out and about and spending so what you know what what would advertisers be paying for and then on top of that you've got the other trend which has also been happening which is a disaggre disaggregation of news so that it's consumed via social media on platforms that aren't controlled by the news agencies so it becomes hard for people to know who's giving them the information they're reading and therefore what, what are they paying for and who, who monetizes this. So this is an ongoing trend that absolutely has been, um, has been hastened. What we saw in the immediate aftermath of the crisis was a lot of emergency funds, the Internews, Luminate, you know, lots of foundations jumped in and said, we need to get emergency funding to newsrooms just to get them to survive. So this is the equivalent of the government furlough schemes that have just kept people going through the lockdown there have been but these are these are temporary and short-lived the, the amount of money that can be disimbursed through these schemes is not going to solve the problem but it might carry them through a few months and crucially it might raise awareness of the fact they exist and raise awareness of the dangers here if you're saying this industry is on its knees so badly that we need to rethink and I think we absolutely need a rethink. And the rethink is what is journalism for and who it's for. So I said at the beginning, at the crisis, you know, at the start of the crisis, there was an uptick in journalists, in journalism everywhere, because people knew that they needed good, you know, good, reliable information, and they needed scientific explanations, and they needed the kind of community, they needed the coronavirus explained to them in the way journalists can explain with, with graphics and data, interactive graphics and, you know, and, and kind of specifics to their audiences. So that was all very needed. And so we need to kind of keep hold of the kernel of that need and kind of build on that. So, you know, we need to carry on producing good journalism and absolutely look at who it's for. And I think this is where I keep talking about the relationship with readers and trust, because this ultimately comes down to the issue of whether journalism will survive. It'll only survive if people need it to feel that it's trustworthy and that it's giving them something they need. And if, if it's not, it will not survive no matter what we do at our end to tweak the business model or look for me revenue streams. Um, so I think that's the first thing is to say, how do we do trustworthy journalism? Part of this comes down to good, reliable journalism, impartial journalism. A lot of it is to diversity, who's been telling the stories. There was a very good report out by Luba Kasova earlier this um, earlier this month on, on women disappearing on the COVID, on coverage of COVID-19 news. It suddenly became a very male space, male, male politicians, male directors of public health, male scientists, and women were quoted as case studies as victims, but women's voices were really taken out of the story. And when you consider that most women most healthcare workers tend to be women, you know, especially at the kind of nursing level. Most carers are women. The the, the lockdown and the childcare duties 
fell disproportionately on women. It's a complete failure of the media to have allowed the, the space to have got completely male dominated so early on. So this is, these kind of things we need to fundamentally look at. And then the second thing is who pays for journalism and is there a model that's, um, that the readers pay directly, that, that it's a public subsidy, that, that it should be supported by foundations? Do we need a different tax structure for, for news organizations so they're treated more akin to charities than private businesses, for example, so they're given more tax breaks? That's a wider conversation that needs to happen, but that needs to happen across society because that would involve kind of fundamental policy change on how we view independent journalism. And before we have that, we need to make sure that there's a strong, good connection with audiences, viewers and readers. Can I just um, build on what Mira is like um, amazing, hit so many really critical points. I mean, just to go back to, to earlier what you were saying about um, you know, the, the impact on news organizations. I mean, we're hearing from journalists that this could be an extinction event for journalism, right? You know, I mean, the, the unpacking how this is, how the economic impact of coronavirus is going to impact the news industry has to do with advertising, it has to do with all of the rest of the economy, of course. But then I just shared um, in the chat, you know, look at freelancers. Freelancers have seen their their livelihoods decimated. Um, you pointed out very importantly about the, the importance of journalism reporting on COVID, but that compounds the problem of the news hole, right? For several months, and, and even now, it's hard to report on anything that isn't about coronavirus. And what does that do to reporting on other public interest issues, on issues of corruption, on human rights, on women, you know, any, any issue, it has to have a COVID angle to even get through. So that has huge potential societal implications. And the importance of local media, you know, of course we hear these great um, anecdotes about how the New York Times has seen all of these rise in subscriptions. But my guess, and this is, you know, CBJ doesn't track this, we read the great research produced by the Reuters Institute and others, but it seems to me that, you know, that is the exception, not the rule. We have seen local news being devastated. And of course, if you can't afford to pay journalists or freelancers to cover those communities, these people are never going to meet a journalist. They're not going to see journalism and why it matters to their daily lived experiences. And when you talk about women, it's not only, I mean, that's fascinating. And actually, if you can put that study in the chat, I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, I didn't absolutely. see that, but like really concerning. Compounded with that is, and again, this is not our research, but <clears throat> I think the International Women's Media Foundation and, and other groups that focus more on gender have seen that women journalists are increasingly also having to have the childcare duties or the educational duties or take up the, you know, home house care duties. And so they're also potentially that's having an impact on who is actually making and doing the news in terms of journalism and, and producers. And so, I mean, again, like I feel like we've touched on 500 topics here because it is so, it's so challenging to create the, the conditions created. And, you know, just to the last point about the economic model from a press freedom perspective, I think that if we think about pluralism as a guiding principle for how we fund the media, that you want a variety of different types of media support. Yes, you want the private corporate sponsor advertising driven media, but you also need public interest media. You need publicly funded media, you foundation, you know, all sorts of different models so that you have different um, impetuses for doing journalism for how they, how they're, you know, what they're focused on, how they're funded and how those funders do or do not influence their editorial line. Um, you know, but we also want to make sure that we're not, I mean, this is just pers my personal opinion, but, you know, uh, if you only rely on, you know, foundations to fund certain types of journalism, then they're going to decide what they think is important. At some point, I personally would like some journalists who are like, this is what we as journalists think is important. So again, it goes back to the principle of pluralism as one of the key components of what we need economically, but also to ensure press freedom. Absolutely. And just one point on the foundations. Ahead, I think yeah. you've done a really, you've raised really important points. The other thing about foundations is they tend to be the effective, the ones with the most money tend to be large international organizations. So if you're talking about trust and relationships with the community, 
often a kind of foundation funded organization is, is treated with hostility and suspicion for a good long time by the local community. And also crucially, you don't want that to kind of crush what local journalism and what local news might be being produced there as well. Yeah, and I, I guess uh, Hungary is a very, very good example of that. Um, with the campaign against Soros, for example, um, over there, it, it was a very, a very stark example, I guess, of um, you know of the, some of the dangers of donor-funded journalism. And yeah, and I guess on the other hand, what we are struggling to do really is build credibility um, for uh, you know for, for what we do. Um, I often tell the story of I was once um, you know moderating a panel um, about xenophobia at Witz University, which is a university in Johannesburg. Um, we've got a huge problem with xenophobic violence um, in South Africa, and we have these kind of like spurts of, um, uh, of violence against foreign nationals um, every few months or every few years. Um, so, you know, so because xenophobic sentiment is also so pronounced, it, it is a very difficult subject to navigate. Um, so we're having this very difficult discussion and a young man in the audience puts his hand up and says, okay, I have nothing to say about xenophobia. I just want to speak to you. And at that time, um, you know, I was still at the Mail and Guardian as editor in chief and says, he says, I love your publication and um, it, it does great work. Um, but why is it so expensive? Um, I, I can't afford it. Um, and so the Mail and Guardian is one of, uh, is the most expensive um, sort of newspaper. Um, in the country. And so I listened to him and then, uh, you know, and he, he was very passionate about this. And then I told him that I also have journalists, um, you know, real people um, who have children and rent to pay. Um, and we need to be generating some kind of revenue in order to keep doing this. And the remarkable thing is that I think until that moment, he hadn't actually thought of us as the male guardian as a group of people, but rather as just a thing. And I could almost see, you know, this, this awakening on his face where he realized, oh, people who also need to eat. Um, and I guess, you know, that's one of the struggles that, um, you know, that we have um, is to actually show our human face um, to our audiences and hope that somehow builds trust. Um, Peter, do you feel that would work at all? In Hungary, um, I am, especially on the funding front. I'm right now optimistic. Maybe yesterday I was more pessimistic at uh, the changes. So what happened with us is the digital advertising market collapsed uh, in the spring, pretty much completely. And this was our main source of revenue. So obviously that hit us really hard. We had to, as many others, introduce the round of cost cutting measures. We didn't fire anyone, but uh, but we, there was a decrease in salaries and so forth. But then uh, I think in late March, we turned to our audience. We have a voluntary donation program that has been going since 2017, and it's become an increasingly important source of revenue for 444. And it grew, like we got, I think, in April, we got twice as much money as we had like the, the full beginning of the year. So even though our readers are not exempt from the economic effects of the pandemic, they still thought it's you know, important for them to, to fund our journalism. And therefore, and that was real money. And that meant, actually that was the money that meant that we didn't have to fire anyone. And in fact, later during the summer after, uh, after the government took over index, uh, that was another huge influx of reader revenue. In fact, it was so strange because usually we think about these things in, or at least I do sometimes, in a very technical way. Something happens, you need to launch a campaign, you need to make sure to, 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 to send a message to your readers. Like there are things you need to do to, to get people to donate money to you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, part of a, it's part of my job or part of our job. Uh, but when Index collapsed, without us saying a word about it, like beyond reporting on the facts that how it was unfolding, but without us saying anything about, please, you know, support us because we don't want to end up where they went, where they ended up. There was a lot of people who consciously like chose to like, the day the editor-in-chief resigned to like, 
to, to put in a recurring payment, to, to support us, to, to send us a letter, to tell us how they are going to support us from then on. So I think for us, this was a really positive experience among everything that was, you know, problematic with the, with the law and, and some of the stuff the government was doing. But we found that our community is willing to support us to even to greater extent than before. I did not think that was possible, but here we are. On the other hand, when um, when we spoke about like how the pandemic accelerate, uh, accelerated some of the stuff that was always uh, going on, we were going to launch a membership program, and uh, obviously we needed to like uh, we need to accelerate that. And now we are at, we have this impossible dilemma. We find that all around the world, uh, that you know lies are usually free where truth is usually you have to pay for and then how do we navigate sort of this dilemma in a country where the government very consciously is working to you know cut people off real information so do we we need to find sustainability for ourselves to continue to pay our journalists and so forth and therefore we need to get money from our readers because there's no real advertising market to speak of. But on the other hand, if we do that and we began producing content exclusive to people who can pay, that means cutting off a lot of people, even if our intentions are completely different of those to the governments, we are still sort of propelling the same, the same thing that we are making the truth be more expensive and leaving lies to be free. So this is what we are struggling with now. And uh, while it's good to have a lot of community support and it really helped us big time to survive. Right now, we need to figure out how to na navigate this dilemma. Mira, how do we navigate um, this very treacherous terrain? I know, uh, you know, it is a di difficult question because everything is uncertain. Um, in Europe, uh, you know, various stages of new lockdowns happening. Um, with new implications on the economy and certainly with that on the viability of news media, but with that as well, um, new pressures on, um, on the media coming from um, governments trying to control certain messages. Um, and at the same time, you know, you, you think about this year, so much has happened. Uh, the huge Black Lives Matter protests that started in the US and, you know, had resonance through so much of the world. Um, in South Africa, we've had a, you know, a huge awakening moment to the scourge of gender-based violence, for example. Um, so much has happened um, in this year um, and yet everything feels very, very uncertain. It's almost impossible for us to plan beyond, you know, kind of three pockets of three months. Um, and it's then impossible then for us to also think about you know, what does the media look like um, in three months or six months or nine months? Um, so yeah. if you could, you know, if you were advising, um, you know, people, uh, you know, journalists around the world, how would you say we actually navigate this, this next yeah. period? Well, there's, I think there's a top down and a bottom up kind of response to this. And the top down response especially is very pertinent to Hungary, Poland, countries in the European Union that are facing a kind of systematic dismantling of independent media with a weaponization of advertising revenue, you know, malicious legislation, malicious lawsuits, you know, this is a deliberate, this is a deliberate and sustained attack on journalism that uses the courts, that uses parliament. And it's, you know, they're doing it while they are part of the European Union. And I think it's fairly clear that there, as Courtney said, some of this has to be about holding governments to account. And by saying this, this, you know, it's about lobbying, it's about protesting, it's about saying you this should be not, this kind of behavior should not be permitted. And if you want to be part of this trading block, if you want to be part of this community and the benefits that entails, then you have to buy into the idea of an independent press and you have to buy into the idea of journalistic journalism journalism and journalist rights for journalists so i think that's a kind of very top down effect where i think there's been quite a lot of good movement i don't be too gloomy this but you know from the conference last year in london um on defending on defending media freedom co-hosted by the british government and the canadian government and there's been kind of sustained 
some government actions to highlight this issue. And I think that that absolutely needs to be increased with the support of organizations like the CPJ. So I think that's the very top down response to um, to this. And then the bottom up response is slightly more complex, or much more complex. Um, and so firstly, to do with saying don't don't make things worse. So in trying to solve problems, don't make things worse. And the Black Lives Matters movement is a very interesting case study because it's a movement that grew and sustained itself and still sustains itself on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook pages, but especially on Twitter. And the media, the kind of mainstream media came to came to the topic quite late in the day. This had been something that had been you know, led by activists and civil society via social media. And we talked earlier about a lot of legislation that's kind of quite draconian misinformation laws. And what we see in Hungary, Turkey, is that you're absolutely right, Peter, it's about trying to stop all debate, because again, the governments know what they're doing here. They're trying to say in the, in the name of stopping misinformation, disinformation, we will produce laws that attack not just journalism, but civil society as a whole. So as Journalists, we just need to be clear, careful what we're asking for when we, if you ask about, uh, you know, how to stop hate, you know, laws to stop hate speech and laws to shut down certain debates, you need to just be careful that you don't accidentally kill off a uh, kind of civil society in doing so as well. Courtney, you look like you were Courtney. about to... Yeah, I mean, I think on the one hand that that's definitely true. And, you know, we should be paying attention also, for example, in the United States to protest laws, to NGO laws, which we've seen around the world um, being used to, to restrict that. But yes, there sometimes there's an attempt to tamper debate and prevent any sort of debate. But I think that the new tactic, because that is also like an tried and true track tactic, but I think the new tactic that we're seeing is the attempt to drown out debate and make it impossible to have debate because there's so much information. There's a flood of irrelevant information, disinformation, propaganda, and all of that, which because we also rely so much on um, algorithmically mediated platforms that have you know, designed to promote or amplify certain types of materials makes it very difficult for journalism to compete. And you have, you know, as has been alluded to, and, and clearly in Hungary, you know, being a lead case where you've got a lot of mainstream media or traditional media organizations that are owned by, you know, either directly by the state or political cronies of those in power or, you know, who just support those. You know, we've seen here in the United States, for example, that certain media outlets, especially those with a dominant local media market, have come out, you know, in support of a specific candidate. And in, and in many countries, that's not unusual. In France, their political parties, you know, and Lebanon, they're, they're associated with media already. But the point being that this, you know, drowning out of any legitimate debate and the challenge of then journalism and journalists breaking through with that useful or relevant information is, I think, an increasing challenge that we're seeing. Yeah, this is what Jay Rosen calls flooding the zone. It's just kind of throwing, throwing absolutely every out there. And, you know, that is what journalists are meant to deal with. We're meant to say we will be the people who sort out this morass of truth and lies and present it to you in a way that that is useful. If, yeah, you know. or, or just of data, because a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of information out there, but I think journalists, and this kind of goes back earlier in the discussion, like journalists can be very useful by helping figure out what to focus on, what in that morass of information is important, you know, but they also have to keep digging because sometimes the information you get is not the information you need to really make sense of everything. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at examples like the Paradise Papers and uh, the Panama Papers and these big collaborative journalism products that revealed, you know, all sorts of interesting insights and corruption, et cetera. It's not like those stories were sitting there obvious in the documents. Like they had to go through a lot of work to turn that that you know raw inf data into information into stories, and so you know we need journalists more than ever, and they need to do more things than ever. Whether it's ferreting out what the story is or making sense of all of the information that's surrounding us. 
Courtney, we are what, two weeks away from the US election. Two weeks, something like that. Um, and we cannot talk about media freedom and COVID-19 without actually talking a little bit about the US um, and um, what the potential for media freedom in the US um, is you know, with the election. I saw, I think it was a Bloomberg report earlier today that said that um, they checked data and more and more people are buying gas masks and like riot equipment um, in the US. So there seems to be some kind of underlying fear of all hell breaking loose in some quarters. Um, and how do you think, do you, would, is the media going to be okay through that? If indeed that happens. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting time. Uh, so I live in Washington, D.C. I also went down to the protests and saw for myself, um, you know, how, I don't know, so, man, so much law enforcement, including undefined federal level agencies were deployed. And so I actually am not surprised by those reports. Um, we are certainly preparing and helping journalists prepare for ongoing and potentially, you know, expanded protests and, and demonstrations. Of course, we're not, you know, regardless of the, the, you know, outcome of the election, we're not, you know, focused on that, but we want to make sure that journalists can cover what's happening, whether that's at the ballot box or in the streets um, or online safely uh, to the greatest extent possible. So we have a whole dedicated safety kit called Press Safety 2020, which is on our website. Uh, that is designed for reporters that are covering the U.S. election. It includes, you know, partnerships with groups like Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which will have lawyers uh, on the ground in certain cities and has a legal hotline. Um, you know, just trying to get that out to reporters, including international reporters, where, because, uh, you know, the U.S. election is an international story as well as a local story. So uh, it's going to be interesting. You know, we definitely want journalists to be prepared with the right personal protective equipment, whether that's for, pro, you know, covering protests or covering COVID. And now, of course, you need to be looking at both of those. We also have COVID safety advisory, which has been updated into 40 languages. We update that about on a biweekly basis or so. Um, so definitely be prepared. And really the best thing a journalist can do to make sure that they're prepared is to do a risk assessment. Understand the story that you're covering, your assignment, what are the potential risks, both in terms of physical, digital, psychosocial, do you anticipate online harassment? Do you need specific personal protective equipment? And we actually have a template for a risk assessment on our website. You can also go to ACOS Alliance, a culture of safety alliance, which um, we work together with very closely and a lot of other groups just putting out resources. Um, and if there's any question that isn't answered by those resources, we have an ask, ask the expert feature. But, you know, it is definitely something we've mobilized for in a way that um, is pretty unusual for the United States, but which we have done in other countries as well. We did specific election programming um, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in India, and elsewhere where we see elections uh, are times of tension, often protest, and journalists are at the forefront. Peter, from Hungary looking out, um, what for you is the most concerning international development on press freedom right now? Beyond Hungary, I think we are looking at the, at the US elections too. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I think uh, you know, Trump, uh, the Trump administration has, uh, has a special relationship with the Orban government, which is, I think, no surprise to anyone who's like looked at any of these people uh, closely enough. Um, I think that um, for us, it was really strange how after uh, the, the 2016 election, uh, Trump came to office, the official foreign policy of the United States uh, states changed very slowly and gradually. Uh, the Hungarian government had a bad relationship with the Obama administration. The Obama administration and their sort of embassy and the people they have dealing with issues here were really vocal about press freedom issues and so forth. 
And that went on for a while, for, a, for maybe a year, year and a half after Trump took office. But then when they sent the new ambassador and when, I guess, you know, certain levels of uh, level of people change in the, in the State Department, that changed and the U.S. became completely silent on this issue, or almost completely silent. So I'm, I'm wondering, even if Trump's out of office, how long will it take with such a massive administration and all these institutions to, you know, to find Hungary on the map again and to maybe voice some opinions on, on issues related to us. It was really strange. The, I think it was a year after Trump took office, the, the State Department had uh, a call, like a tender out for, for local media uh, in Hungary. This really pissed off the, the Hungarian government since they spent a lot of money acquiring every local media outlet there, are, there is in Hungary. And so they were like really upset about the Trump government uh, planning to give money to all these independent uh, whatever uh, initiatives uh, to fund. And then that was withdrawn. And I think that was sort of a turning point from then on. It was very much in line with what Prime Minister Orban wanted. So we'll see how long it will take for the US to you know, get back into whatever they were doing prior to Trump. But I mean, I if I can just like build on that, I mean, the normative fabric of you know for for to uphold press freedom and just international human rights broadly has is in tatters. So regardless of what the outcome of the election is, that is not going to suddenly you know be rewoven because you have somebody different in office. It is going to take a lot of work to repair and recreate the normative fra- fabric that we've done over the past several you know several decades to create you know in- international human rights standards and, and you know already those norms are contested right so we're going to have to look at you know would the united states rejoin the human rights council rejoin unesco um, you know all of these other institutions because even if you have on day 2 you know the president speaking out in defense of press freedom how is that going to have any weight if there aren't the actions um, to to support that so you know i think that the the destruction done through the deterioration of norms and especially the whole fake news enemy of the people um, rhetoric, which has been accompanied by real policies in many countries is going to take a long time to undo. And, and I guess, uh, Courtney, what, uh, what the Trump administration has taught us is that a lot of good work can be undone in an administration um, within a couple of years of an administration. So even if um, a Biden administration happens um, and does some repair work, it could again be undone by, I don't know, uh, uh, Trump Jr. Um, uh, you know, in, in another five years. And and I guess this is why the U.S. is now just, I guess, not a reliable actor um, when it comes to issues of, uh, you know, of advocating for human rights and democracy. Um, elsewhere in the world. Um, very recently, the, um, the embassy, the US embassy in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, uh, released a statement about upcoming elections there, um, noting that, you know, that there are tensions um, in the country and urging all, you know, all, you know, all sections of society to remain calm and peaceful. Um, and a lot of Africans just found great mirth in that statement, because um, and I think, uh, you know, there was one particular writer who actually turned that around and said, um, here's, a, you know, here's my spoof letter from the African Union to the U.S., um, you know, cautioning the U.S. on, uh, you know, tensions in, you know, in their own backyard um, ahead of the election and, uh, you know, cautioning them about, you know, protecting the rights of the press, et cetera. Um, and I guess that's, that's what the U.S. has lost now. Um, it's it does it lacks the moral authority 
I mean, I think it's all, I mean, there's always been a contested moral authority, right? I, so, and, and I, I also am a, a scholar of international relations. So I've like thought about this pretty deeply, but there are, you know, there's always a, a large degree of hypocrisy and, you know, multiple different interests that states have. So, you know, the Obama administration on the one hand spoke about press freedom, met with civil society groups in advance of trips, for example, to Ethiopia, where he then meet, you know, met with say independent journalists or bloggers. And on the other hand, he also oversaw, you know, drone attacks that outside of the framework of international law. Um, and, and, you know, there were more prosecutions of whistleblowers and the use of the Espionage Act that implicates journalists than any other administration combined. And he oversaw a mass surveillance regime that also was then used to target journalists. So again, there's like always a degree of, you know, uh, it, states are and governments are multifaceted and have many interests but typically traditionally including for example under the bush administration again democracy promotion agenda devastating iraq war and war on terror that had all sorts of repercussions but traditionally the us has seen as part of its interest the upholding of international norms and the perpetuation of things like press freedom um, which we just don't really see anymore from either the president or Pompeo. I mean, Maria Ressa is a Filipino American journalist facing serious charges in the Philippines, and we have not seen the U.S. come out strongly uh, in support of her. She's you know American citizen as well as a Filipina citizen, and this has huge repercussions for journalists around the world. Not because the U.S. was going to sweep in and save them. But there were cases where we saw an impact of, you know, the US or the UK raising specific cases of journalists that that could then mean that they would get better treatment in prison, that they would get a family visit at the very least, that maybe we could prompt an investigation into a murder. And that's just a lot, lot harder under this administration. But also it's not just the US, it's also the UK, which decided to, you know, launch this big global media freedom campaign in conjunction with Canada, get all of this, you know, press about their commitment to media freedom. And yet, on the other hand, you know, breaking international law, you know, not actually doing anything that has an impact to improve media freedom. We don't see them speaking out, for example, on Saudi Arabia, which you know, has a devastating record. We don't see them taking up the mantle of pursuing justice for Jamal Khashoggi's murder when the U.S. has just let that, you know, go by the wayside. So, you know, there's a lot of hypocrisy around the world, unfortunately, and we just have not seen any government come in and take up the mantle that the U.S. let drop. So I think that's a nice segue to a question we've got in the Q&A box and any of the panelists can uh, respond to it. Uh, for some reasons, post COVID-19, I see the rise and consolidation of state backed and run news media in the global south. So I see the rise and consolidation of state backed um, and state run news media in the global south. I also see the rise of a more of more repressive governments. How do you guys see the state of government funded media post COVID-19 and the role of independent journalism? Um, any of you? Want to take that? I can take that because I recognize the name. It's Alvin Jimbani from Botswana, who was also a journalist fellow at the Reuters Institute about two years ago. And actually, he his paper was one I was referring to earlier when I talked about foundation funded journalism, because he um, quite rightly pointed out some of the risks and pitfalls of relying on foundation funded journalism if you are a small investigative startup in southern in Southern Africa, for example. So I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, how do I see the state of government funded media post COVID-19? I think problematic. And I think it, it, it kind of, we talked about this earlier as well, but what I've seen is that it seems to coincide with an idea of a nationalist narrative. So on one hand, you get um, outright propaganda being blunt from uh, Ch Chinese state sponsored media from CGTN aimed at the English speaking world. So posts um, coverage in English that, um, presents coronavirus in a kind of very China positive way and uh, highlights how well China is doing while highlighting how badly other countries are doing. So it's just framing the narrative in a certain way. But you also see, um, again, the UK, the BBC, you know, the government, you know, using this opportunity to launch a very concerted and sustained attack 
on the credibility of the BBC and you know threats to its funding model and threats to its um, its independence and kind of again raising a kind of public almost raising up a mob against the public sector broadcaster you know say you know raising kind of urging the public to be mistrustful of the public sector sector broadcasting they're paying for so I think this is very 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 dangerous and um, the future of independent journalism again Alvin I think you know as much as we do because I think there's um we I think it's undoubtedly important I think um I think it's undoubtedly crucial um, I think Courtney was right about the loss of local journalism at exactly the moment that we need local news because this is this is absolutely the news that's vital. It's what's happening in your neighbourhood. And again, in the UK, the, the restrictions are so local that only what's happening in the streets around you is relevant to you because what's happening in the next town is completely different. So we absolutely need hyper-local information right now as a society. Um, and I, I'm it'd be good to see more independent journalism kind of filling, filling that because there's a desperate need for that there. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else want to climb in there? So, I think that, uh, Peter? Yeah, just uh, very quickly. I think that we'll see more state-sponsored journalism. Just, I think, by nature, as some outlets go out of business, there will be more opportunities. The state will always want more influence, more control over information, and their resources are, you know, a magnitude or a few magnitudes larger than private entities. I'm not, it was mentioned before, how state sponsored, like how state funds or, or public funding can be beneficial to journalism. Um, this is similar to the debate whether what's best if Facebook is led to be governed by itself or states are led to govern by Facebook. And I think in Western Europe, in my experience, the debate is, is over. Most people think that states should be uh, responsible for, uh, for governing Facebook to, the, to a greater extent, whereas in Central Europe, if I think about our government, uh, you know, governing or, or regulating Facebook more than Facebook does regulate itself. It's not a it's not a good thought. And I think there's a divide here with state funding as well. I can't see any type of state funding as beneficial because our relationship with our state is, I think, fundamentally different than someone in a journalist in Germany or the Netherlands or even the UK. I think people hear that the lesson over the past 30 years since the transition was the more state funding there is in journalism, the worse it is, the more biased it is, the, the more partisan it is. And therefore, I don't see that route, but maybe it will work eventually here too. So we've, uh, we've got, you know, just a few minutes left and we cannot possibly end this um, end this panel on such a dour note. Um, where, um, where do you find hope right now, Peter? Um, I think in, in our community, um, so the thing is we are being attacked quite often by you know, the, the sort of this huge government media sphere and uh, their sort of fan base or trolls or whoever. And it's uh, when you're constantly surrounded by these voices, it, it has an effect on you. But sometimes it's good to to reach out to your own readers, to to read the, the letters people send you and to look at the support you get, uh, even in a time of crisis. And for me, I, that I think all in all makes me optimistic than pessimistic about our future. It's it's an incredibly challenging time. And what's happening right now has, you know, tomorrow can be completely different. We There can be a, another wave of the disease. There can be even more serious economic crisis. It's all very volatile. But, but I think it's always worth, you know, talking to your readers, reaching out to them, trying to, you know, put some institutions in place to to have like a community uh, to get feedback because most of it is, at least in my experience, positive, and you can you can draw a lot of strength from it, or at least we could. I agree. I agree, Mira. Um, you spoke about um, something that gave me a lot of hope earlier this year. Um, in the first stages of the pandemic outside of China, I think nearly all of us saw record numbers of people on our websites. Um, 
I was going to sleep with, you know, with my phone in one hand, just looking at Google Analytics with a smile on my face, um, because it was just such a beautiful thing to see. Um, and, uh, you know, and that gave me hope because, you know, as, you know, as all panelists have said that in this really curious moment in human history, people understood the value of good information um, and they sought it out, they actively sought us out for that. Um, that gave me hope. And uh, what gives you hope? Um, I, well, I think that, I think the, that kind of uptake and the fact that people did in, in a time of crisis turn to journalism. This is, you know, it's almost like when a child is scared, they turn to their mother, you know, they, it, it was just like this instinctive reaction to go to the trusted brands that they recognized and look for information. And that, that you know, so the, that kind of desire for news is, is there, it can be buried and lost and there's like um, so much demand for our attention, so many more appealing things to do online than follow the news that all this is going to be um, harmful, but, you know, but there is that demand there. And I also think going back to kind of answering Alvin's question a bit about independent journalism is that there's a lot of new journalism as well. There's a lot of people a lot of communities that never saw the news as representing them creating their own news, creating their own websites, creating their own investigative journalism. You're getting more, um, more journalism that's diverse. You're getting journalism that's more innovative. The, the kind of the tech revolution that's on one hand crushing journalists and it is crushing journalism is also creating a space um, for, for, for what for I think what will be the future of journalism. I think that there is there is hope there, but it but it really won't be easy. And I remember at the Perugia festival again with a sense of nostalgia. Um, I can't remember the speaker, but the imagery stuck with me. It said, "This is like the forty years of the wilderness in the wilderness." You know how the the kind of uh, the Israelites under Moses were forty years in the wilderness, and you figure out what's important to you when you spend that forty years in the wilderness. You decide what you keep. So leavened bread, we can you know we can live without it. We can we can we can eat flat bread. The Torah, you know the the things that are fundamental to you, you carry through the desert because you know you'll need them when you set up the new place. So I think that's where we are. We need to think about what we can jettison. And it might be painful because we might have quite enjoyed eating soft bread, but we keep the kind of things that are core to us, precious. That's a fantastic answer, Mira. thank you. Courtney, what gives you hope? I don't think you should have ended with me. Um, I am really struggling right now to find the silver lining because one of the, I mean, going back to kind of what we were talking about earlier, one of the silver linings of working in, in this domain where you are working on some pretty tough issues on a day-to-day -day basis was getting to, you know, meet some of the journalists that we helped get out of prison or meeting the families of the journalists who were trying to get justice when their, you know, family members were murdered because of their journalism. And you don't get to do that anymore because, you know, we're not in person. So I'm going to maybe try to get some hope from what Mira said, but, you know, I'm just very wary about hoping too much. Having, you know, I wrote my doctoral dissertation, my book about the so-called Arab Spring and, and the, you know, the uprising. And I had a lot of hope after spending, you know, years on the ground with these young people. And uh, many of them are behind bars or in exile. So I think we have to you know, stay strong. We have to really support journalists. We have to stand up for press freedom. We, you know, need to keep our nose to the grindstone or whatever that phrase is and um, try to find those rays of hope. But I know for me, it's just that, you know, I find hope in the day-to-day -day work um, that I do because then at least I'm not like doom scrolling. Uh, but yeah, I guess, you know, what Mira said, the innovative new ideas that are coming out, the, you know, individual journalists who are finding ways to keep going and media outlets that are finding new models and, and innovations. So I guess um, it's a call for eternal vigilance, really, um, um, on society, but also on our existence, on media freedom itself, but also um, hopefully a call on all of us for resilience. Um, the world would be an intolerable place without a free media. Um, and it's something that we have to protect. We cannot fathom of ourselves without uh, an independent media. So we just have to brush ourselves off and keep fighting. 
So thank you to everybody who has joined us and thanks to those who asked some really lovely questions. And um, I wish we could um, we could give a huge round of applause for these panelists because you guys have all been fantastic. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I've enjoyed spending my Friday night with you. Um, and uh, all the best to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye.